beginning with verse 11. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria wore sore trouble for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Obviously there was a tattletale in the kingdom, okay? <laughs> and one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? Or what do we do now? And he answered, and look at this answer, Fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes. Everybody say, open his eyes, that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around about Elisha. And when they came down to him, this is the horses and chariots of fire, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. Now notice he opened the eyes of the young man, but he's closing the eyes of the enemy. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto him, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you see. But he led them to Samaria. <laughs> And it came to pass when they were come into Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, when he saw them, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? And he answered, thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hadst taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. And it came to pass after this that Benadad, king of Syria, gathered all of his host and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver, and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, when shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor, out of the wine press. And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today and will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son, and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son, that we may eat him. And she had hid her son. And it came to pass, when the king heard the words of the woman, that he rent his clothes and passed by upon the wall. And the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. Then he said, God do so, and more also to me of the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. But Elisha sat in his house, and the elders sat with him, and the king sent a man from before him. But ere the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, See ye how this son of a murderer has sent to take away mine head? Look, when the messenger cometh, shut the door, hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And while he yet talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him, and, sa and he said, Behold, the evil is of the Lord. Why shall I wait for the Lord any longer? Hallelujah. Amen. I want to preach just for a little while in your hearing an open and shut case of deliverance. Hallelujah. Let's just ask the Lord to help us this morning. My God, we love you. God, we come on, let's just pray, church. We love you, Lord. We believe your help. God, this morning is at the hand. God, Lord, we need you to just step into this place right now. Let the anointing of the Holy Ghost take over, Lord. 
Speak to our hearts and move, Lord, on our minds today, God. We'll give you all praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Let's give you my hand clap of praise that you're seated. I love you, Jesus. Lord, I worship you, oh God. I praise you, oh Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, let's say praise his name. I love you, Jesus. I give you the glory. Lord, I magnify you, oh God. I praise your name, oh Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Now, of course, this is the same king. <laughs> this is Jehoram. And Jehoram had a problem already with Elisha. He was not really, uh, Elisha did not really care for Jehoram because Jehoram, uh, although he had done away with Baal out of uh, Israel, King Jehoram still kept uh, doing the sins of his fathers. Amen. In fact, if you want to know who his father and his mother was, uh, his mother was the wicked woman we always know as Jezebel. His father was Ahab. Amen. And, and so it was kind of a thing, I guess, that ran in the family. And uh, although he had done away with the male worship in Israel, and I think Elijah had a little bit to do with that. If you remember uh, Elijah up on the mountain, amen, on Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal, the 400 prophets of the groves, it came uh, and the showdown that uh, they had with God. Amen. And God uh, delivered Israel from Baal worship. Amen. During that time. And so uh, when Ahab died and when uh, Jezebel met her fate and the dogs licked her blood off the streets. Amen. Then we find that Jehoram has taken the throne in Israel and and he's continuing on in the sins of his fathers. Amen. Those that were before him and those that were before Ahab even. And he he did not turn to the Lord. He he didn't reinstitute Baal worship because he understood that God had shut that down. Amen. It, it was his dad that uh, the punishments of God fell on. It was his mom. Amen. That was cast out of an upper story window and and uh, the dogs came and ate her and, and licked up her blood off the pavement. It, it was uh, those folks, amen, who had had the Baal worship going. And, and he understood the ramifications of that. So he didn't try to restart it. But he did continue into things that he should not have been. And he continued, amen, to lead Israel in the wrong direction. Amen. He, he continued to lead them away from the one true God. And into some kind of a false religion out here somewhere. I want us to understand we are living in a day and hour when false religion is at its peak. Amen. You can have anything that you want. I, I was uh, tickled the other night. My wife uh, told me that one of our good friends, a preacher's wife that we've been knowing forever, amen, is fixing to go back to Alaska and uh, her dad had some property up there, and they've got a camp they go to once a year up there. And so they were headed to Alaska, and she said, while I'm up there, I'm going to attend church. <laughs> and I said, she, my wife said, oh, really? Where do y'all go to church in Alaska? And she said, she kind of chuckled. She said, well, we go to the spaghetti church. <laughs> I'm like, what? The what? And, and, and so she, she told my wife, she said, we, we went there last time we were up there just to see what it was. It's a pretty good joke. Amen. But uh, I, I thought that can't be true. This is some, some kind of foolishness. And I got online, and sure enough, it's a big organization. Amen. And they call themselves something along the line of First Church of Spaghetti or whatever. And, and the, the leadership wears colanders on their heads. Amen. Uh, I think there's a few wackos in the world today. And and you would think that people like that would not really have a following. You would think that it would just be some kind of foolishness, but there's literally thousands of them around the world in, in the spaghetti church. Amen. But I'm glad this morning that I know truth. Yeah, amen. Right. Oh, come on, the Bible said you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Hallelujah. I'm so glad that he's made me free this morning from the laws of sin and death. I promise you, spaghetti will not set you free. That's right. The most it'll do is give you indigestion. Amen. 
And, and so I'm glad that I got a God. I don't have to, to seek after some stupidity in this world, amen, to try to make a, a, a God out of it, amen. I, I was hearing a few years ago, there's a church of Elvis, amen. There's the, all these different churches around the world, and, and some of them are plain foolishness, and some of them are, are really sincere, but they're following the doctrines uh, uh, of the world. They're following a man-made doctrine, amen. But can I tell you here this morning, there is a one true living God, hallelujah, and he has come out, amen, in this last day and hour, and he's going to show himself in his power and in his might, hallelujah. Amen. We, we need to understand this morning how privileged of the people we really are. Amen. That we can walk into his presence. Hello. Oh, come on. I, I don't even have to come to church to get in his presence. Whew. Amen. I have to come to church, but I don't have to come to church to get in his presence. Hallelujah. I can get in his presence in my car. I can get in his presence at the house. Amen. I can get in his presence in a grocery store. Amen. You know what? He's around me all the time. Uh -huh. he, he said, I'm never an arm's length from you. If he's that close to me, all I've got to do is reach out and touch him. Hallelujah. Ah, oh, hear me this morning. He's, he will quicken my spirit ever so often. I, I may be in a store somewhere, and, and all of a sudden I feel the quickening of the Holy Ghost. I feel that, that anointing, that little shove of the Spirit, and, and God will show me somebody, and, and, and I'll need to go talk to them. I don't know them. I've never seen them or met them before, and, and, and I'll need, I'll know there's an urgency. I've got to go and visit with them, and so I'll introduce myself and strike up a conversation many times. Oh, come on, I want us to understand this morning who it is that we're serving. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, Jehoram, the king of Israel, amen, he knew the one true God. He, he knew all about that. Amen. They had prophets still in Israel. There were still a men of God that spoke the truth. And, and, and that was why Jehoram hated hated Elijah and Elisha so much. Elijah, amen, Elisha's predecessor was the one that had stood on the mountain and had killed the prophets of Baal and and had killed the prophets of the groves. It was Elijah, amen, that, that hit and, uh, his wife, his mom had said, you know what, uh, your head, Elijah, is going to be mine. And, he, and Elijah, of course, ran for the wilderness and and, and sat under a juniper tree, and, and God spoke to him, and, and an angel showed up and fed him and said, Here, I want you to eat because you're fixing to go on a journey. And he sent him, amen, for 40 days, the Bible said, journey into the wilderness. Oh, uh, but can I understand, we need the direction of the Holy Ghost in our lives. Hallelujah. We need God's specific direction, amen, for me and for you. Hallelujah. Because if you're not, if you don't have a specific direction. I can't tell you how many there are in this city here who are just wandering aimlessly around. Amen. Looking for something. They don't realize that what they're searching for. Oh, come on, hear me. They go to bar rooms. They go to, to, to drugs. They go to alcohol. They go to cigarettes. They go to different things in this world trying, amen, to find something that will calm their nerves. They go to psychiatrists. They go and, and get on those psychiatric drugs and and go for treatment because there's something going on in them that they don't understand. Can I tell you this morning, 90% of the time, it's just a search for the God that we know here today. Hallelujah. So, Jehoram is upset because Everywhere he says, everywhere he goes, amen. Uh, for instance, Jehoram said, you know, uh, I, I'm 
going to camp out over here, or, or the, the king of Syria said, I'm going to camp out over here, and, 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 and you know, we're going to wait. And uh, when, when Jehoram's men come by, and Jehoram comes by, uh, then we're going to attack. And, and God spoke to Elijah, and he, Elisha, and he tells King Jehoram, Amen. Can I tell you, even though, Amen, he was away from God, and even though he was turning Israel away from God, God was still speaking through to a man of God to him. Aren't you glad for the mercies of God? Yeah. It, it, grace is, is extended mercy. Hallelujah. Amen. It, it's when God extends his mercy rather than just taking you out. Amen. He extends his mercy to you. That's grace. Hallelujah. And, and so the grace of God, the mercy of God has been extended to, to Jehoram. Even though he's still living in the sins of his fathers and even though he's still leading Israel in that direction. Amen. God's mercy has gone as far as God's mercy can go. And, and finally, amen, uh, uh, the king of Syria said, I've got to find out who it is. And so he asked his servants, who is it that's, that's telling uh, the, the secrets of the king? Who is it that's letting uh, Israel's king know where I'm at and what I'm doing? Is it somebody in my, my palace? Is it somebody that's sitting in my administration? And the servant said, no, there's a prophet. Hallelujah. There's an old preacher over there. Over, oh, come hear me this morning. Hallelujah. There's an old preacher over there. And, and he keeps spilling the beans on you. You see, that old preacher's in touch with God. And, and he knows the mind of God. Hallelujah. And, and so uh, what's happening is every time the enemy plans something, uh, amen, God reveals it to the man of God. Uh, and he, he is able to, to tell the king, uh, and they're able to avoid a catastrophe. Uh, oh, can I tell somebody here this morning, uh, amen, you need to be understanding uh, that God has put a man of God in your world, amen? Uh, and the reason he put one there uh, is so that you can uh, avoid the pitfalls uh, and avoid the things that Satan would lay as a trap for you. Amen. You understand we're living in a day and age where there's all kind of good stuff out there that you can attach yourself to. There's all kind of things out there where you don't have to live a little holier than that. Amen. Where you can live like you want to live and do what you want to do and still call yourself a child of God. But can I tell you in this day and hour, it's critical that you know, amen, God, in the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Amen. It's critical. Now, so the king of Syria said, well, we're going to go talk to this guy. <laughs> and now, did you ever notice this scripture? He's just going after one old prophet, but he carries a whole army and surrounds the city just to get one old man. <laughs> you know, the enemy is afraid of the people of God. Uh -huh. If you can ever understand that concept that the devil really is afraid of you. Uh -huh. Okay, y'all didn't catch that. Come on now. That went right over some of y'all's head. <laughs> the enemy is really more concerned and so they take as many people as they can take. They take an army. Hallelujah. And they surround the little city of Dothan. And they are going in after Elisha. Elisha's servant the next morning gets up and he walks outside. And he goes, oh my goodness. He runs back in and he tells Elisha, what are we going to do? The whole town is surrounded. Come on, there's an army all the way around. What are we going to do? And Elisha just simply prayed a quick little prayer. Lord, you need to open this kid's eyes. 
Come on, there, there's some of us in here this morning. You need to have your eyes open spiritually, amen? Because you're playing with things in the world. You're playing around with God. And God is saying, don't you understand? I've got your situation. It's in control. Don't worry about it, amen? But we all fret and we all want to want to just uh, tell God what kind of problems we got going on and he needs to take better care of us. Oh, but he already has it. The Bible tells me that the angels of the Lord camp around those that fear him. Hallelujah. So they're already there. So he prayed, Lord, open his eyes. And the Bible said he looked, and all the way around were chariots of fire. Hallelujah. Amen. And there were angels as far as he could see. Amen. They well outnumbered the army that had been sent. Oh, can I tell somebody here this morning, it, it, it's, there's an open open place, amen, that you need to understand. You need to have your eyes opened, amen, to what God is trying to do in your world. You need to have your eyes open. There needs to come an understanding as to why God has brought you to this point and to this place. Amen. It's simply the fact that God wants you to come out of sin. He wants you to back off and come to him and say, Serve him with everything you got. Amen. So, God needs to open our eyes. Hallelujah. Because there's things happening in the spirit world in this day and hour. Amen. That you better have your eyes open. Amen. You better know the mind of God. You better understand. Hallelujah. Amen. That there's a God that is still in control. No matter what it looks like to the world. Amen. God's got this. Hallelujah. I said God's got this. No matter what's happening in your life. No matter what's happening in your family. No matter what's happening with your friends. Amen. If you're trusting in the Lord. If you're putting everything that you've got into serving him, then God will open your eyes and allow you to see into the spirit realm and let you know that everything is going to be all right. I've got this. I'm in control of the situation. The problem was there was an enemy that had their eyes open also. And so the enemy begins to come off the hillside and begins to come down. Now, this is where a prayer comes in. Hallelujah. And Elisha began to pray again. And as he prayed, he said, Lord, I want you to close the eyes of the enemy. Ooh, hallelujah. Can I tell you deliverance will come only, amen, when you get your eyes open and God closes the eyes of the enemy around you. Hallelujah. You can't have your eyes on the enemy. You've got to know, amen, that there's a God that's in control in your world. You've got to understand this morning, it's not about me. It's not about you. Amen. It's about the God that we serve. And that's why we're here here today is to pay homage to him. That's why we're here today. Amen. It's to encourage you to serve the Lord while he is still able to be found. And so he said, Lord, close the eyes of the enemy. I, I, I just got this crazy picture. There's an army coming in from all sides. That means they're all the way around the town. They're completely surrounded. But all of a sudden, they're all blind. So they really don't know where they're at. Hallelujah. Now, I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell me how it happened. It just said that Elisha said, Oh, guys, you're in the wrong place. Hallelujah. Let me take you to where you need to be. And so he takes the Syrian army. It's probably just a platoon. It probably it wasn't the whole army, obviously, but it was probably just a platoon. And, and he said, let me carry you guys where you need to go. It's obviously you're blinded. You can't see. 
they know where you're going, so you probably need me to take you to where you need to go. <laughs> Hallelujah. So he carries them to Samaria. And the king of Israel comes out when somebody comes to the king and says, we're not sure what's going on, but a blind army just walked in. <laughs> and Elisha was leading them. Hmm. Well, so you got an advantage over them. Hallelujah. Now, now, the king of Israel said, well, I want you to look, look how he addressed the, the preacher. He, well, my father, you know, oh, and I pat the preacher on the back of the Oh, my father. Should I go ahead and kill him? He didn't say it once. He said it twice. Should I go ahead and kill him? <laughs> and Elisha said, no, he ain't done nothing. <laughs> I can't see you. They just, can't. you know, they were just here just a few minutes ago when I brought them in. They didn't have eyesight. So you had the advantage over them. So just feed them good and let them go. And so he did. But then all of a sudden, things begin to go wrong. Because immediately following this, amen, the Syrians came and they came back to Samaria. And the Bible said they literally surrounded Samaria with their whole army. Amen. And they camped out outside the city walls. And this was a common thing back in those days. They would camp out and they would starve out the people and as the people were starving sometimes they would leave the city and when they would they just kill them when they came out as it was quicker death and then laying in there starving and so uh, they're, they're in there starving the city has been besieged and the Syrians are, are camped all the way around it and, and it looks like the enemy has won uh, come on hear me this morning and the king is walking up on the wall one day and he hears a woman down below crying out to him oh king I need your help I need your help oh, come on hear me today Amen. this king looked down at her and said what's the deal I don't understand everybody here needs my help what's your problem and she said well yesterday one of my friends and I got together and we decided that we were to kill and boil my son and eat him yesterday and that today we would kill and boil and eat her son and we killed mine and we boiled him and we ate him and today she does not want to kill her son the bible said that the king rent or tore his garment and as he tore his garment the people that were there looked up on the wall and they saw that underneath his clothing next to his body he was wearing sackcloth amen sackcloth was a form of repentance amen he was he was doing a little bit towards uh, coming to god he was doing just enough amen to let people know that that he was trying but he was so ashamed of it he still had his kingly robes on top of it oh can i let you know today amen that god I want you to come in full repentance. You don't have to be embarrassed. Amen. Everybody, we were all sinners. Amen. God brought us all out of sin. Hallelujah. Everybody here, let me sound my voice and have the Holy Ghost. Amen. At one time, was a sinner. Some of us were in bar rooms. Some of us did drugs. Amen. Some of us were in this world in other realms. But can I tell you, the reason we're here this morning is because of the mercy of a God who loved us anyway. That's it, baby. Amen. It's an open and shut case. God opened the eyes of, of Elisha's servant so that he could see what God was about to do. Now, we understand that Israel's or the Samaritans Amen. Uh, in this city are, are, are literally starving to death. And so much so, amen, that uh, one woman and, and her friend are eating their kids. Uh, 
we can't even begin to comprehend that kind of hunger. Amen. I, I want us to understand this morning. Amen. There was a hunger inside of the city of Samaria. But the king, amen, because he wanted to keep the city in sin and wanted to keep it going the way that he had planned for it to go. Instead of submitting it to God, amen, those people began to starve because God's judgment was falling upon that city. Amen. I want you to understand the same God who had opened the eyes of the servant and they closed the eyes of the enemy. Amen. Was now himself dropping judgment upon the city of Samaria. Oh, let me show you what happens immediately. Amen. The king begins to blame Elisha and he begins to say, you just wait. I'm going to get that scoundrel. And he sent a messenger over and he was going to bring Elisha in and they were going to cut his head off. Oh, but God already showed Elisha what was going on. Can I tell somebody here today, amen, when God begins to move against somebody in judgment because they refuse to quit living in sin, the first thing they want to do is blame the church or blame the preacher. Can I tell you today, it's your own fault that you're where you're at it falls in your plate. All Elisha did was try to let the king know. But Jehoram already had said in one previous scripture. When they, the king of Judah asked him, said, is there not a prophet in the land that could talk to us? They were fixed to go to battle. And Jehoram had said, no, 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 no. There's that old stinking Elijah over there. But I don't like him because all he says is bad stuff about me. He never prophesies anything good to me. Well, get out of your sin, stupid. <laughs> don't give the man of God anything to preach about. Don't give the man of God anything to preach judgment about. Move out of your sin, Elijah said. Oh, but Jehoram just kept on going and kept on living the way he was living. And now he's taking Israel down that road. And so God's judgment has fell on Samaria. But the first thing he does is go out to the preacher. Oh, come on, hear me this morning. I'm not condemning anybody. But I want you to understand this morning. If you, if you have problems in your world, if judgment begins to fall on your household, it's your problem. It's not God's. It's not the church. It's not the man of God's. It's your problem. Now, judgment fell on Israel because of their sin. He took away Baal worship, but he didn't stop the sin. So, judgment fell. You see, in verse 21, amen, he called Elisha, my father. But by the time you get to verse 32, he was ready to kill him. <laughs> because of the sin factor that was there. But you see, God, they had opened it up. Through their sin, they had opened up the judgments of God. And the judgments of God are sure. Hallelujah. We're living in a day and age of easy believism. There's no real substance to preaching. And when scripture backs it up, Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead in his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they shall not endure sound doctrine. How the guy just a few days ago, 
well-known man in this city. But he didn't say it, but he had told somebody else, and they told me, can't go to that church because of what they preach. Can I tell you that we preach the truth here? I don't preach what everybody else preaches in this city. I, I, I don't preach what everybody else preaches in this world. Amen. You, you understand in this days, this day and hour, they're heaping to themselves teachers because they've got itching ears. They want you to teach something that will make them feel good. I, I refuse. I'm not one of those preachers that's going to get up and pat you on the back and say, bless your heart, honey. You'll make it till next Wednesday. You'll make it till Tuesday night. Bless your heart, baby. You're going to survive from Tuesday to next Sunday. I, I, no, 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 no. I'm one that comes here today to tell you you've got to move yourself from sin. You've got to get out of sin. You've got to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to repent of those sins. You've got to ask his forgiveness and turn and walk away and leave those sins in a pile behind you. Amen. You've got to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. Yes. There is no other way. Or the remission or the washing away of those sins. There's those that even teach nowadays it's not necessary to baptize no more. I'm sorry. Baptism is essential for remission. If you don't repent and remit those sins, they're still hanging there on you. Amen. But when we baptize you, amen, it washes those sins away. Hallelujah. Oh, into a sea of forgetfulness. God never remembers them anymore. The enemy might remember them, and he might bring them back up from time to time to remind you what kind of a dirty sinner you were before you found the Lord. But can I tell you, God will never bring them back up again unless you go back and commit sin again. Hallelujah. Now, So Paul tells Timothy, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears, what, from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Anybody know what a fable is? It's just a story. Don't have any really meaning to it most of the time. It's just a story. It's a fable. It, 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 just, it doesn't lead anywhere. Amen. And, and that's exactly what is happening in this day and hour. Amen. I, I don't have a television, but I, I talk to those that do have them from time to time that, that they click the channel on and they listen to those TV preachers and and I would dare say that 99% of those preachers on that television, if not 100%, amen, they get on there and they tell you what you want to hear. They, they pat you on the back and tell you what a good old boy or girl you are. And you can make it, bless God. Oh, come on. There, there's even churches nowadays that don't preach against homosexuality anymore. In fact, they actually, amen, bring it in. They, they, they hire preachers that are homosexuals. Oh, can I tell somebody here today, amen, that God will not tolerate that kind of mess. He will not tolerate sin in any way, shape, nor form. They keep in sense of teachers. You ever notice how many people there are out there, how many churches there are out there now? Man, they got a great teaching ministry. Well, that's good. I love to teach. I really do. But teaching is not to preach the word. Amen. Preaching brings it down home. Amen. Preaching puts it in your lap and says, here is what the word says about your sin. You've got to come out from among them. You've got to be separate. You cannot touch the unclean thing, saith the Lord. You've got to be different. Now, As long as the preacher's not preaching judgment. As long as he's preaching something, make me feel good, he's a pretty good old boy. 
That's why you go to certain big arenas and there's literally thousands of people in that arena because there's no substance in the man of God there. And you can say what you want to say. Call me a liar if you want to. It don't bother me. Hey Amen. I'm just telling you how it is. Hey Amen. The reason they fill those arenas up is because they do not preach anything. Hey Amen. That is going to destroy sin in your world. They do not preach anything that will convict you of the sin you're living in. And they won't tell you you've got to quit. You've got to come out. What they will tell you is, oh, you're a good guy just like you are. You, you just need to start talking to God a little bit. and you, you just need to acknowledge that God is there. Can I tell you? Oh, there's going to be people in hell. The Bible tells me that's going to say, we did great works in your name. We cast out devils. We heal the sick. We raise the dead. We did all in your name. And Jesus is going to say, I don't know who you are. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Can I tell you, we don't do this. If your heart is honest, you don't do this to lie in your pockets. We do this because it's a calling. We do this because there's still sinners in the world that need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. We do this because there's a world that's headed headlong to hell. And we are the watchmen on the wall. And we are the people that has to stand out in the middle of that road and try to deter them out of that road headed to hell and give them a deter into the path that leads, amen, to heaven. According to the word of God, 1 Peter 4, 17, 18, for the time has come that judgment must begin. It didn't say may begin or could begin or should begin. It said it must begin at the house of God. It starts here. You don't want to wait until you get to the other side and stand in the judgment bar. And have God point his finger in your face. You want to be able on this side of the river. Amen. To, to fall on your face before God in repentance. And to ask God's forgiveness for the sin in your world. And to turn an about face. And to walk towards that God who loves you enough to forgive you. And, and walk away from that sin that has so easily beset you. That sin that has led nothing in your world but to death and destruction. And that man of God stood in the path and helped deter you. You need to understand this morning that God lets judgment start here. Because he's a merciful God. Judgment starts at the house of God. Because he's a merciful God. He placed a man of God in your world that loves you, who's going to preach the truth to you, who's not going to cut any slack, who's going to tell you that right is right and wrong is wrong, amen, that sin is sin, and you've got to come out of sin, you've got to follow the doctrine of the Holy Ghost, you've got to be saved, you've got to be filled with the Spirit of God. The Bible lets me know that without the Spirit of Christ, we are none of His. What is the Spirit of Christ? The Bible tells me if this same Spirit dwell in you, which dwell in Christ Jesus, that at the last trump, it's going to quicken your mortal body. Hallelujah. Oh, can I tell somebody here today the reason that it's going to happen that way is because you sat under the sound of a voice of a man of God that loves you enough to tell you the truth and to tell you sin will take you to hell. It will destroy you, but come out from among them. Be you separate. Don't be like the rest of the church world. Get the Holy Ghost. Be baptized in the name of Jesus, and you shall. Yes. Ooh. You shall be drawn aside from this world. You won't act like them. You won't look like them. You won't smell like them. He changes you. He rearranges you. 
There's a good man of God that I've been knowing for several years. Amen. Probably most of you have heard of him. He's in California. Rialto. I've been to his church with him, Larry Booker. He's about that tall. <laughs> He's taller than, than I am, Brother West here. Man, when he's here, uh, he's taller than Brother West, I think. Brother West is 6'8". He's probably about 6'9", 6 6 Brother Booker's a tall guy. But, but if you understand, if you ever read his story, amen, he was living in Oklahoma, and he had hair way down his back, and he had a beard way down his front, and he was an old hippie, amen. He, he grew up in the ages my wife and I grew up in, and, and I'm dating us here, but 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 we, we were there when the hippie movement was going on, amen. I, I remember the flower buses, hallelujah. I remember the flower children with their little headbands and their long hair, and I remember walking down the streets of New Orleans one day and seeing one of them walk down the street, and he was so so bombed out. He didn't even know he was in the world. And that 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 throng of people walking by him so swiftly. And he was just kind of ambling along, staring straight ahead. And had that hair way down his back and that beard way down his front. And had his little headband on with the flowers on it. And had him a Mickey Mouse purse on his shoulder. First time I ever saw a guy with a purse. And uh I thought, my God, what's wrong with that guy? Amen. Because I didn't understand as a teenager. I didn't understand what in the world God was doing in my purse. Amen. My wife would tell you, I don't even carry hers. She said, can you get my purse? And we'll be in, in Walmart or somewhere. Oh, I forgot my purse in the truck. You might run and get it. I'll run out there and get it, all right. I set it over in a buggy and I pushed the buggy in. I ain't toting that thing. <laughs> Amen. I'm secure in my manhood. <laughs> but we grew up in that era. Brother Booker grew up in that era. And and he he, he was stoned out of his mind and and he was truly up on a whip hand. And, and God got a hold of him one night. And he came to an old altar. And he repented of his sins and, and he turned and he walked away from his sins and walked toward his God. And he was baptized in the name of Jesus and got filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. And when he came out of that situation, he was a different person altogether. Amen. If you were to see him today, you could never tell that he had ever been a hippie. Amen. All that stuff left behind. Reason being because God had took the place of all that stuff. You see, the reason that people do the things they do. It's because they're in search of God. They don't really realize it. But you're constantly searching. Constantly looking. Constantly trying to find that God. But you look Remember there was an old country song came out years ago. I don't know who the singer was. I just heard it on a jukebox in a restaurant one day. Looking for love in all the wrong places. That pretty much describes, and I wondered if the singer that wrote that, amen, didn't have a, a, another deeper meaning than just uh, looking for love from women, but I, I really kind of felt like maybe he had a little background in this somewhere down the line, and, and, and that he he was just expressing the idea that, you know, we go about and we look for love in all the wrong places. We go to the places that appease us, amen, and give us some kind of a sense of being for a, a short time. Amen. We, I, I've seen them go to the bar room and spend their whole paycheck in a bar room and then Monday morning when the rent's due they don't have the money to pay it and they're so upset and they're so distraught I've got calls from them before would you help me pay my rent why so you can continue in sin no I don't think so listen you've got to come out of sin you've got to live for God amen when you start living for God everything starts 
starts getting a whole lot better because all that money you were spending on booze and drugs, now you can spend it on things that really mean something. Hallelujah. You can go to the house of God and you can worship him. Oh, hear me today. Can I tell somebody here, amen, that God wants to open your eyes in the spirit world and close the eyes of the enemy that's following you around, tormenting you day after day after day. You know, I've had folks in my life that I've heard them say, I would lay down on the bed at night and I couldn't go to sleep for hours. Sleep, I may not wake up on this side. Can I tell you that when I got my eyes open, whew, and open and shut case, by the way, <laughs> when the Lord opened my eyes to the spirit realm and to what He's got and the good things He has for us, I gave myself to Him. I sold out. Now, what you can say in East Texas, lock, stock, and barrel. <laughs> Amen. I gave him everything. I, I, I walked away from that world not looking back because there's nothing back there that means anything to this guy. He set me free. Hallelujah. Yeah, I love that song. I hope Brother Leonard Blackman used to sing that in our church in Monmore. Amen. He used to get up and he would think he wasn't really a singer. He couldn't sing worth a hoot. Amen. But it wasn't the, it wasn't his voice he listened to. Amen. He'd get up there and he'd just break out in a chorus. He was supposed to be taking the offering. But he, he'd just break out in the chorus. And he set me free. He set me free. Hallelujah. He broke the bonds of prison for me. Oh, I'm glory bound. My Jesus to see. For glory to God. He set me free. Hallelujah. He could sing that. Because at one time in his world, he was drink a fifth of whiskey a day and God delivered him and set him free and changed his world. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That same God's here today. He's here this morning. His desire is, is that we will repent of our sins, that we will come clean with him. Oh, come on, repentance is asking God's forgiveness, but it's much more than that. It's walking away from that sin you've asked him to forgive you for and walking towards him. It's changing your focus. You're no longer focusing on the things that have brought you pleasure in the past. Now you're focusing on a God that has joy and peace and contentment. Hallelujah. Oh, can I tell somebody here today? Amen. You need to change your focus this morning. You need your eyes open to the spirit realm. God needs to close the eyes of the enemy in your world. Time has come that judgment must begin in the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of Christ? What's their end going to be? If, if God judges us here in the church, amen, us that are our, 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 our regular attendees, us that we used to come into the house of God if judgment begins here and, and we're under that judgment. Hey Amen. What's going to be the end of those out there? Hey Amen. That, that just go off on their daily routine on Sunday. Hey Amen. They don't acknowledge God in any way, shape, nor form. They, they, uh, there's people out there that have never set foot in a church in their life. They know absolutely nothing about the church. All they know is the church is a charitable organization. And if I need some gas or I need a 
a meal. They'll, they'll take care of me. That's all they know about a church. Oh, can I tell somebody here today, you are a privileged person. Amen. That God has brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Oh, come on. He's brought you here because he loves you. what's going to be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God. And if the righteous scarcely he texts as we said out of the skin of his teeth. If the righteous scarcely be saved then where shall the sinner and the ungodly appear? So, the righteous, now, do you know what righteous folks are? That's people that do everything they know to do and a little bit more in serving God. Amen. That's people that, that they, they live for God. They do it right. They, they make sure there's no sin in their life. They're always constantly checking God. Uh, search my soul, Lord, if there's any sin in my life. Uh, Paul said, I die daily. It, 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 a righteous person is one that repents every single day they live. Uh, hey, you, you, you just got to stay on top of this uh, because sometimes, uh, amen, the enemy is slick and he'll slide in there uh, and he'll tempt you with something uh, that you don't even realize you've already done it before it's too late. Uh, amen. But God is faithful and just. Uh, so we repent every day. Amen. We die to this flesh daily. And that's where the righteous come in. They've learned to overcome the flesh. They've overcome the spirit world. They've overcome the demons of hell. And now they're one-on-one -on -one with God. Hallelujah. Amen. I've had the Holy Ghost over 51 years now. And can I tell you, this is the best thing that ever happened to this old boy. Amen. If it hadn't have been for God stepping in and intervening when he did, I was on a road that would have been certainly a downhill slide. And I probably would already have been in a grave many years if it hadn't have been for God stepping in and intervening and pulling me out. Amen. And filling me with his spirit. So, where are you going to be? Deliverance is here. Judgment begins here. But aren't you glad there's a deliverer in the house? <laughs> aren't you glad there's one that can set you free from your sin this morning? Aren't you glad there's one Amen, that loves you enough that he gave his life that you could have? Let's just see. God, we love you, Jesus. We worship you. Come on, let's just talk to him right now. Everywhere across this, across this congregation, if you would just bow your head, close your eyes, and let's just talk to the Lord right now. My God. Come on, just ask the Lord to search me out. Lord, if there's any wicked way in me, if there's any sin in my life, God, would you please forgive me and cleanse me? Come on, just talk to him. Ask him. He's faithful and just to forgive you when you ask him. Just ask him, God, would you forgive me of the sin in my world? I've got to be free. I've got to be free. I've got to be free. It's an open and shut case of deliverance. God, you've got to deliver us. You've got to deliver us this morning, God. Lord, open their eyes today, God. That we can see the things of God in our life, God. To close the eyes of the enemy. That he won't be able to find us in the stories, God. Come on, let's just talk to him right now. My God, I need your help. Lord, I need your spirit, oh God. Lord, I'm asking you, God, that you would help me today, God, in the name of Jesus. Come on, talk to him, church. Talk to him, church. I need you, Lord. I need you, God. Lord, would you help me today, God? Would you forgive me, Lord? Would you cleanse my mind and my heart, God? Would you set me free, Lord? Would you make a new creature out of me today, God? Would you help me, oh God? I need you. I need you today, Lord. Come on, 
must talk to him right now. Just tell him, I need you, Jesus. Lord, search my soul, God. If there's any sin in my life, forgive me and cleanse me, God. I need you, Lord. God, I want to open my heart to you this morning. I want to close it to the devil in his courts, but I want to open it to you, oh Lord. God, I open my life up to you, Jesus. Lord, would you come in? Would you fill me with the Holy Ghost today, God? Would you help me, oh Lord? Come on, let's talk to him. Come on, let's talk to him right now. My God, come on. You want to find a place around the front? Let's come and pray. Let's come and pray. You need to bring yourself up to this altar. You need to repent. You need to give your heart to God this morning. Lord, forgive me, God. Cleanse my mind. Cleanse my heart today, God. Lord, make me a new creature. I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, God. I want to be filled with your spirit. I want to know you and the power of the Holy Ghost today, God. Come on, let's pray. Let's pray. My God, help us, Lord. Let's pray. Jesus, help me, oh God. My Lord and my God, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, God, we love you, we believe you, we worship you, oh God, we thank you, oh Lord. Come on, you don't need to be ashamed of repentance today. Uh, come on, that king had that sackcloth hid under his garment, under his kingly robes. He was a little bit ashamed of it, but I want us to hear it today. Amen. We don't need to be ashamed of repentance. Just call out to God. It don't make no difference how long you had the Holy Ghost. Paul was a man of God, a powerful man of God. Wrote over half the New Testament. He had to die out to flesh every day. <laughs> God, we love you, Lord. We believe you, Jesus. Come on, let's talk to him. My God. My God. Come on, let's pray. Jesus, we need you, Lord, right now, dear God. He loved that Kaye Kato Holo Lolo Boko Shatta Kia Lela Bahasata Kia Bahaya. My God. In the name of Jesus, right now, Lord, to the Lord, in Jesus' name, God, the Holy Ghost, God. Hallelujah, Lord. Jesus, in the name of Jesus, right now, we thank you, Lord. We thank you. 